So this morning, we were doing a hearing for a guardian ad litem. Um, and that one is on the matter of Yasmin Malone versus Jerry Talbert. Um, looks like Ms. Malone is represented by Mr. William Lester, who I see on the call. I see Ms. Malone, great. Then Jerry Talbert. Um, I see Mr. Talbert. Mr. Talbert was represented by Ms. Clark Wilson, but I, that, that um, motion to withdraw was granted. So, Mr. Talbert, did you ever find an additional, to ever find another lawyer, or will you be representing yourself today? Still working on a judge. Still working on finding another counsel, more counsel. I only had a couple weeks. So. All right. Then we're going to hear the motion. Um, you'll have to defend yourself on the motion um, for guardian ad litem. Mr. Lester, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Appreciate the court setting it down this morning. No problem. Uh, to our mind, you know, this is a very straightforward motion and request. Um, the, there's one child of this relationship. Uh, it was not a marriage, but the parties had a prior proceeding, and that was in Fulton County, and that was resolved in 2020. And under the terms of that order, uh, my client is, is really the primary uh, custodial parent and, and importantly has the final decision-making authority on educational matters. Uh, Jeremiah is uh, six years old. He's, he'll soon be seven years old. Um, he has been diagnosed as having uh, significant separation anxiety. He has been uh, uh, given at school a 504 plan to address his uh, emotional issues and some learning issues and so forth. And a problem we have in this case that the court will learn about, which is one of the primary reasons why we feel that a guardian ad litem is appropriate in this case, is that um, the evidence will show that Mr. Talbert uh, significantly undermines all efforts to have the child treated. He has tried, he's endeavored to con contact the school and cancel the 504 plan. He refuses to cooperate with uh, treatments and modalities that are scheduled during his parenting time. Uh, we have issues where my client is entitled to every other Wednesday and he has consistently refused to have that. Uh, we have um, a situation where he has uh, been violent to this child. Uh, we've had to contact DFACs. As the court knows, defects is rather overburdened and often just particularly when they know that there's a case pending such as this one, they just sort of punt on it, close the file and expect the court to deal with it. But that doesn't change the facts that there uh, has been physical abuse of the child. Um, there are a myriad of reasons why a guardian is appropriate. We have filed this motion. Um, there was no timely response within 30 days. There was an untimely response filed objecting um, that dilatory and delay response is consistent with from the outset, Mr. Uh, Talbert evaded service. Um, the sheriff went out to his residence multiple times, saw that there was activity inside the house. Nobody answered. Ultimately, we had to have him served in a courthouse in Fulton County in an unrelated proceeding where he knew he'd be, we, he would be present. And even then, he waited months after service to even have his attorney enter appearance and start participating in this process. Um, so it's not surprising that he's taking the position that he doesn't think there should be a guardian in this case. Uh, I have contacted Don Smith, who the court is probably familiar with. Ms. Smith uh, sort of specializes in dealing with cases like this, where there are educational, developmental, emotional issues. And Ms. Smith has expressed a willingness to serve as a guardian in this case. Uh, so we uh, recently submitted to the court our proposed order appointing Ms. Smith to serve as a guardian. Under the terms of that order, each party would be required to pay one half of uh, her uh, retainer and expenses with the court having the authority to uh, revisit that at the conclusion of the case to decide whether that should be reapportioned. But simply put, Your Honor, we are asking the court to go ahead and grant our order, enter it, uh, let uh, Ms. Smith get started with the process and the investigation, and then provide to the court appropriate input from time to time as needed in this case. That's our position, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the child is primary, who has primary physical custody? Uh, it's, it's fairly equal in terms of the physical parenting time. Um, there, there was an order that is, is problematic that it's probably not uh, appropriate or necessary to delve into today. But as part of this case in the modification request, we are going to ask the court to clean up some deficiencies in the order that was granted in the Fulton County case in 2020. Uh, but the um, my client, my client is not even getting all of her parenting time because, as I said, 
uh, Mr. Talbert has consistently refused, even though she requests every week and says, I'm entitled to this Wednesday coming up. He says no. Uh, he interferes with her having uh, contact with the child. She got a gizmo watch for the child and has removed it and taken it from the child so that she can't uh, interact with the child when uh, 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 Jeremiah is with the father. Uh, but as to the educational issues, my client was designated the final decision maker. Okay, so uh, with regard to the 504 plan, you're saying that Mr. Talbert does not want him on a 504 plan? Yes, he has contacted the school and he's tried to cancel meetings. He's undermined meetings. Um, I, I'm not a psychologist. It just He just doesn't seem to cope well with the fact that his son has issues and he wants him to tough it out and not have anybody uh, professionally assist his child in working through his anxiety, only really making the situation worse. Okay. All right, Mr. Talbot. Yes, Judge. Um, speaking specifically to the fact that um, Mr. Lester has said his client has primary uh, physical or legal custody, we have joint legal and physical custody. Um, the judge signed the order um, that my counsel provided giving Ms. Malone final uh, education and, um, you know, non-emergent health and giving me extracurricular and religion as we re as we requested. So um, that that's an inaccuracy. Uh, Miss, the school did not put um, Jeremiah on a 504 plan. Ms. Malone did. Um, and that was at her own request. The school cannot issue a 504 plan. Ms. Malone tried to get the school to evaluate Jeremiah for learning disability and, and separation anxiety through the school counselor. They denied that. So she went about her own way. Um, and speaking to the uh, separation anxiety diagnosis, there's been no, absolutely no record. There's no, 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 phy no physician that's a specialist. Um, she said that her, um, his primary care physician um, requested, uh, said he had separation anxiety. That's impossible. I work in healthcare and I know that it has to be diagnosed by a specialist specifically. Got no records of that. Ms. Malone went about it on her own to put him in uh, 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 therapy. And that was uh, when he was four years old. And when he was done with that therapy, they, got, they said that he was fine. He could move on. There was no issues. Um, and then Ms. Malone went about unilaterally telling me that the school wanted to talk to me about Jeremiah, not knowing that she'd already spoken to the school and already put him on a 504 plan. And I was coming late to the party and did not know what was going on. Speaking um, specifically to the parenting time, um, in the in the agreement, there was supposed to be um, uh, one Wednesday. Ms. Malone, first of all, asked for to, uh, a, a night to spend him to spend the night during my time because we have a week on a week off. Um, she in the in the order, it was supposed to be a Wednesday from four to seven uh, for him to spend the night. And I said, no, that's not in the order. So she never requested to get him for a few hours. Um, as far as the defects, uh, the defects case. Um, Jeremiah, um, Ms. Malone filed, uh, filed a defects case um, saying that I, I punched Jeremiah in the stomach and I slapped him in the face as well as my other children. Um, Mr. Lester is also inaccurate in the fact that that case is closed and there were no findings. Before, after she filed that, um, that, that defects report against me, um, she subsequently filed a TPO. And she, before the TPO was granted by the judge, because you know how those, those, are, those work, um, before it was granted by the judge, Ms. Malone, uh, was in contempt of court and kept me from my son um, before the TPO went into place and, you know, essentially would not take him to school. So he's got an absentee list. Uh, uh, he's got over seven days absent from the school because she knew she couldn't keep him from me legally until she got the TPO in place. Subsequent to that, I didn't see my fun, uh, son for a month and a half. When we went to the TPO case, the judge also dismissed that case without prejudice. So um, I just want to clear the air as far as um, the 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 delays and, and my apologies to the court for the delays as it relates to uh, me um, answering uh, this, uh, you know, a, a pr proceeding with this uh, modification. Uh, first of all, Ms. Malone never told me that there were any abuse allegations. She put a video in the without Jeremiah's knowledge in the room as her evidence in the TPO case and le and started out with the video saying, well, where does so how does so daddy hit you in the stomach? Right. Um, which is clearly uh, some there's some issues related to that. But uh, as it relates to my delay in answering the court, I'm, I'm also um, in, in court proceedings with another one of Mr. Lester's clients, who uh, is my ex-wife, who fled the state and left our two younger children behind. She left with my other daughter 
and her and Ms. Malone have been colluding with me and Mr. Lester has been representing them both. So resources from a resource standpoint, obviously with taking care of my son week on, week off and taking care of my younger children without any support, um, I'm, I'm kind of left at, uh, uh, at a bit of a loss financially. And I'm trying to put, put that together so that we can move forward and, uh, for, with these proceedings because it's obviously not about my, my character being assassinated or false allegations. It's about the children. Mr. Yes, Thomas. Yes, yes, Judge. Now, if you leave, leave the last 30 seconds to the actual reason why we're here, which is the yes, motion. Yes, Judge. I don't get what's the issue on that. So, yes. So, um, as far as that goes, I mean, I don't know what the protocol is. I have nothing to hide. Um, if it, I believe that Miss Miss Malone, who put forth the proceedings, she didn't want to talk. She didn't want to um, modify, uh, do anything from a mediation standpoint. She she moved forward with these proceedings. Um, then you know she should be responsible for the guardian ad litem. But if if that's if that's the if the, if we if an, a guardian ad litem is granted, I have no problem. I have nothing to hide. So we'll go from there. I don't because we're dealing with some educational issues. Um, I think a guardian ad litem would be best particularly Mr. Talbert, if you are of the opinion that um, there are none existing, that I think it would be best. Excuse have. me, Judge. That's inaccurate as well. I never said that. Um, Jeremiah has Jeremiah has emotional issues, but he doesn't have any um, education. You can hear, you hear that from all of his teachers. And I've been of the mindset that a, a 504 plan isn't the, the issue. It's more of a, a structure um, as far as uh, how he's in. And those differences, and I mean, we can... We can go through that as we proceed right, with the proceedings. I can't lie because I don't think you, to some extent, you're not understanding the 504 plan if you think that's the distinction, because mm -hmm. it's, that, that is not how it normally works. I mean, if you have emotional issues that affects your education, then you need to be on a 504 plan, potentially. So I don't think, um, I, I don't think a, a 504 plan is about education and it doesn't take in consideration emotional. I mean, what if you think about it, um, are you familiar with ADHD? Yes, I am. Okay, so that's an emotional thing, right? Because it just means that you can't stay focused. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a mental health issue, right? But that plan, but that um, medical diagnosis can affect and involve in a five hundred four or even an IEP, even though it is not it has nothing to do with your ability to learn the material. To the but to you can you can learn it. You just have to learn it in a different way. So and that's judgment. why a 504 plans in the first place. That's that's why they are developed. That's yes, the point. Yes, Judge. I just want to say that um, well, a, another yes. issue. So because you all are in, uh, you are at, at odds as to the need for that. That's mm -hmm. the reason why the guardian would be important because the guardian ad could be able to explain to you in a much better manner. And also if in opposite to Miss, Miss Malone to the extent they find this not necessary so that We'll have a good understanding of what's necessary for, for your son because I don't know what his issues are. And I would hate to make a bad decision um, without having some persons with some expertise in the field to help. And, and I'm completely okay with that, Judge. I appreciate that. I appreciate the explanation. Okay. Your Honor, um, Ms. Smith likes the parties to utilize Our Family Wizard so that she can go and monitor uh, uh, the communications between the parties. And I would ask the court to order the parties to both sign up for our family wizard, uh, pay for their own share for that, and then uh, grant access to Ms. Smith once she is appointed so that she can overview the communications between the parties. That'd be good. All right, Mr. Lester, if you do an order for me. I will. Them. I've done an order appointing uh, Ms. Smith, which I previously sent, but I'm going to amend that order to include the our family wizard language, and I will send that to your chambers later today. All right, that will work. You both take care. A couple of house Thank you, Your Honor. Have a good day. These are Thank official you. court proceedings. These are public proceedings. We are streaming live on YouTube. The Zoom link, password, and YouTube link are available on the court's web page. No drinking, no driving, no smoking, no eating, no, excuse me, no walking through the hallways or the warehouse of your employment. Find some place where you're comfortable, be seated and be still. That means no driving, no drinking, no eating, no smoking, no lying in bed. All right, I'm ready to proceed. Right. Thank you, Your Honor. Again, Greg Golden on behalf of the plaintiff, Emil Blau. 
And I don't know which cases are memorable to your honor and which are not. Um, this case came before your honor um, uh, a year and a half ago, um, actually longer than that. This was filed in 21. Uh, the parties were previously married, no children. They were divorced in 2015. And pursuant to their settlement agreement, there was an insurance policy that Mr. Blau was um, agreed to maintain. Um, subsequently, the defendant got remarried and a declaratory action was filed by Mr. Blau um, that that life insurance obligation is periodic alimony and her remarriage um, terminated that obligation. We had a hearing on a motion to dismiss before your honor, where your honor did find that it was um, in fact periodic alimony. It was then scheduled for a trial. And after um, that trial, your honor ruled that um, promissory estoppel and mutual mistake um, prevented the termination of that alimony obligation. Mr. Blau sought appellate review. Uh, the Court of Appeals accepted his application. And after it was briefed by both parties, the Court of Appeals issued its decision back on back on June 21st of this year, um, reversing your honor's decision. Uh, that decision is attached as exhibit A to uh, my the plaintiff's motion for supersedious bond. Well, that tells you, Mr. Golden, I definitely didn't didn't not, not forget it. I got reversed. <laughs> <laughs> the, it's, it's always funny being in this position as far as um, reversing a trial judge and hoping they don't keep score. But uh, the, the this court of appeals did reverse your honor's decision. Um, the defendant filed a motion for reconsideration with the court of appeals. It was denied. Then she filed a petition for certiorari with the Supreme Court of Georgia. And that is where it is pending now. During this time, my client has um, continued to pay that um, alimony obligation, um, even though he believes that he is not required to. And we're asking that this court um, go ahead and set a supersedious bond uh, pursuant to five OCGA 5646 um, to cover the costs of this uh, premium, which is, as your honor is aware, is increasing each year. And if the defendant desires to have this policy maintained while she seeks um, certiorari, then we are requesting that she be responsible for it or that um, Mr. Blau be relieved from maintaining that policy. With that, Your Honor, I believe that everything else is covered in the um, in our motion and the legal authority cited therein. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Cook. Yes, Your Honor. Um, as indicated, we have, in July 28, we filed our petition for certiorari with the Supreme Court, and that has not been ruled upon uh, by the Supreme Court. So the matter is still pending in the, uh, as far as the appellate process. The relief requested by um, plaintiff in this case under OCGA section sign uh, 5646A is not authorized by that statute. The code section allows the court to grant a supersedious bond uh, to secure a money judgment. And the statute says a money judgment, the amount of the bond shall be sufficient to cover the whole amount of the judgment plus the cost of appeal and interest. And the only other uh, uh, authority granted by that statute is if uh, to secure a disposition of property, uh, such as in real actions, trover, uh, et cetera. In this case, there is no money judgment to secure. There is no disposition of property that the court uh, uh, un under the order. Uh, the court simply resolved a legal controversy in the declaratory judgment action, answering the question of whether uh, the, the, out the insurance payments were required to be continued to be paid by the plaintiff under the party's final decree. Uh, Your Honor held that he had to continue the payments uh, under uh, uh, issues of promissory estoppel and mutual mistake of law. The Court of Appeals, again, disagreed with Your Honor, reversed the decision, but now we have asked the Supreme Court to intervene. So all he's doing is maintaining the status quo uh, uh, under, under what was being paid under the final decree. So simply, the, the, Your Honor, just simply does not, the statute does not grant the trial court the authority to, to, to grant a supersedious bond in this case for the reasons I've articulated. Um, our case cited uh, in the brief 
is that uh, under the language of the statute, quote, an implied prerequisite to requiring a supersedious bond is a money judgment uh, unless the action involves injunctive or other equitable relief. Uh, that's the um, Burge decision cited in my brief. So again, there is no money judgment. There is no disposition of property award. The plaintiff is getting creative by taking 24 months of insurance premiums and trying to reduce that to a money judgment to try to come within the statute. But simply, the authority is not there uh, to grant a supersedious bond. Um, what's your response to that, Mr. Irwin? Yes, Your Honor. Um, each month of a periodic payment, whether it's alimony or child support, is a money judgment. If um, if my client was ordered to pay a thousand dollars a month in alimony and he doesn't pay it after a month, the defendant would be able to um, file a garnishment and would be able to collect on that thousand dollars. This premium, this monthly premium, is periodic alimony. There is no difference. It is something that falls within the statute, and not knowing how long. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court of Georgia is going to take to rule on the petition for cert, um, whether it uh, uh, grants it or did, did, um, rejects it, uh, don't know. So I pulled out 24 months, whether it's 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. But this is absolutely a money judgment that falls within this code section. OK. And our response to that is the court didn't it, the court didn't order him to make these payments. You just resolved a legal controversy. Your, your judgment did not order, uh, uh, did not set or, or order the terms of payment as given in the example by the by plaintiff's counsel. Mm -hmm. Mr. Blau was seeking a termination by your honor's ruling that continued that obligation that the Court of Appeals has found to be improper. So if so he is having to continue to make this money judgment. And that's the relief that we are seeking is to protect against. Okay. I'll take an advisement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. May I be excused? Okay. okay. So the yeah, point put it on for the motion for summary judgment. I'm um, looking back through the notes here, and it looks like there was a request specifically for no court trial, no hearing or trial. And it looks like that was made by Mr. Branton. Not, this court has a position, and I think this is probably why that could have been ignored, that all motions for summary judgment are placed on the calendar. Um, and so that specific request is probably why it wasn't, um, why it wasn't adhered to was because that's the court's position. All right, so Mr. Branton, why, why did you make the request for no court hearing or trial? Uh, Your Honor, I, I was uh, under the impression that uh, you, uh, it, it would have been a point where you made the final decision. Uh, we went through uh, GCEO and uh, special masters and uh, it was coming to you next. So I uh, uh, thought for the, for the process for you to make the, the final decision, I, I thought I was requesting that. Uh, I apologize if that was wrong. I'm sorry, you thought you were requesting what now? Uh, I, I thought I was requesting um, for you to make the final decision. Uh, I was requesting for, uh, so I was requesting uh, Summary judgment uh, with no court hearing or trial. I thought that you know, so far as you make the final decision uh, after you did the case. All right. Well, um, okay. So go ahead and proceed. Okay. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, uh, uh, what I'm about to read are uh, findings and evidence presented by the GCEO and the special master. These are uh, the notes as well they had. Um, my name is Kevin Branton. I, I proudly served for over three years as a soldier in the United Army, uh, United States Army. Also, I was um, uh, on March uh, 2018 is where I want to start. I was medically discharged from the military um, due to the complex regional pain syndrome in the left foot uh, in May 2018. Um, only two months after being medically discharged from the Army, I was employed uh, by DJJ as a cadet in the Metro Youth 
uh, regional youth detention center. Uh, during orientation in June 2018, I engaged in protected activities by requesting two medical accommodations by um, from DJJ Metro YDC based on my military physical profile. I was submitted to a uh, few human resources. Um, I was discriminated and retaliated against by uh, based on my military injuries. I was denied reasonable accommodations based on my injuries. Uh, I was also falsely accused of submitting a fake doctor's note about my skin disorder by HR management. Um, I was falsely accused of submitting a, a fraudulent birth certificate uh, for employment by human resources. Uh, upper management belittled and retaliated against me because I requested an investigation into human resources for allegedly tampering with my birth certificate. Um, I was threatened by upper management with being arrested on the job for allegedly submitting a, a fraudulent birth certificate for employment. I was told by upper management that I was nobody and how dare I investigate into the human, human resource staff. They could fire me and have me arrested right now on the job. Uh, the next day, upper management, Dr. Brandenburg, retaliated and submitted uh, me for over 35 days without pay pending an investigation over the birth uh, certificate. Uh, upper, upper management also retaliated against me by allowing an employee, Sergeant Baker, to approach me on the work floor in front of my coworkers. Sergeant ba Baker informed me that human resources informed him that I was being suspended pending an investigation because I was submitted, uh, because I submitted a fraudulent birth certificate for employment. Um, and I needed to leave the premises immediately. I was humiliated in front and embarrassed in front of my coworkers because uh, Sergeant Baker escorted me off the floor and off the premises. Um, uh, Director Brandenburg included uh, and denied, oh, excluded and denied me a physical uh, mandatory training opportunity based on my left foot injury and for me allegedly submitting a, a fraudulent birth certificate for employment. Um, the uh, the training opportunity known as post uh, would have con um, contributed to my professional advancement to becoming a correctional officer, sergeant, a firefighter, or even a police officer. Um, according to Dr. Brandenburg, I was not a good fit to attend post training. Director Brandenburg stated that she thought I was a little off when she spoke to me. Um, Sergeant Baker told me uh, that I will be I will not be going to post training because he sees no purpose for me on his team. Referring to my foot injury, um, Dr. Brandenburg, I mean, Director Brandenburg and Sergeant Baker discriminated against me um, when they stated that I was not a good fit. Referring to my foot injury for post training, Dr. Brandenburg excluded and den um, excluded and denied me from attending post training uh, on June 28th, 2018. The same day as uh, Director Brandenburg suspended me pending an investigation, uh, Director Brandenburg signed paperwork to terminate my employment based on an alleged falsified birth certificate and questionable, questionable medical notes from my doctors. Uh, uh, Director Brandenburg had no intentions of conducting an investigation. She wanted to terminate me because she had already made her decision that I was not a good fit due to my physical impairment uh, to work for DJJ as a correctional officer. She thought I was crazy and a little off. She quoted, uh, Director Brandenburg in HR uh, viewed me as a nuisance and a problem. I was discriminated and retaliated against, suspended with no pay, denied post-training, humiliated and embarrassed in front of my coworkers. Uh, HR shared my private and confidential information with coworkers as I uh, <clears throat> I was accused of defamation and I was constructively discharged for requesting two medical accommodations for my disabilities for allegedly submitting a fraudulent birth certificate and fraudulent doctor's note for my employment. Director uh, Brandenburg never um, conducted the investigation on me. Uh, the special master noted that DJJ did not treat me according to DJJ's own discrimination and retaliation written policies, policy number 3.49 and 3.18. Uh, Your Honor, on September 19th, 2018, I filed an employment discrimination complaint with the uh, GCEO. Uh, 
I was retaliated and discriminated against. I was wrongly uh, discharged based on my mil my military disabilities with employment while employed with DJJ. The GCEO conducted an extensive investigation with DJJ's employees, and on September 19, 2018, the GCEO found reasonable cause to believe that DJJ engaged in an unlawful employment practice under the Georgia Fair Employment Practice Acts of 1978 SEPA. Um, DJJ and I were unable to settle the matter, so the administrator referred to the matter uh, for resolution by a special master. On November 4th, 2021, a one-day, eight-hour hearing uh, was held uh, by the special master. The special master conducted an extensive investigation on March 21st, 2022. The special master found reasonable cause to believe that DJJ discriminated and retaliated against me and DJJ has engaged in, uh, in an unlawful employment practice under FIPA. Your Honor, both the GCEO and the special masters also found that several of DJJ's employees conspired together and illegally tampered with my birth certificate to stop me from attending post-training and to get me fired. Your Honor, my original birth certificate showing my uh, date of birth is that I submitted to DJJ's HR staff on May 3rd, 2018 during D DJJ's job fair was deleted from DJJ's HR confidential files slash records and illegally replaced in June 2018 with a fraudulent December 17, 1993 birth, birth certificate by human resource staff. I informed Dr. Brand, uh, Director Brandenburg and HR staff that only two months ago, I was medically discharged from the military as an honorable dis, uh, disabled veteran. Why, I'm, uh, why and what reason would I have to submit a fraudulent birth certificate for employment? I informed DJJ that GCEO and the special master... I, yeah, okay, DJJ and the GCEO and the special master that I believed HR um, Ebony Jones and employee Sergeant Baker conspired together and illegally tampered with my birth certificate to get me fired and to stop me from attending post-training. The special master noted that human resources specialist Ebony Jones and Sergeant Baker had an inappropriate relationship at work, even if not romantic. Special Master also noted in her report the numerous inconsistencies and contradictions in Director Brandenburg and HR staff interviews and written statements do not merit uh, giving Director Brandenburg or HR staff the benefit of the doubt because they are not credible, creditable and unworthy of credits. Uh, the Special Master noted in her report HR staff Ebony Jones was a bad actor with dishonest conduct and a lack of credibility concerning my falsified birth certificate. Uh, during the special master's investigation, she also found Director Brandenburg, HR Tech Ebony Jones, and Sergeant Baker in violation of OCGA 45-19-44, personal liability and violation OCGA 4519 Four, five unlawful conspiracies with bad actors and several of DJJ's employees tampered with my birth certificate to stop me from attending post and to get me fired. Your Honor, Georgia recognizes the um, doctrine of uh, respondent uh, superior with provides which provides that an employer, DJJ, can be held liable for negligent acts committed by its own employees while they were within the course and scope of their employment. The uh, OCGA 51-2-2. Uh, Director Brandenburg, HR Manager Lawrence, uh, Sergeant Baker, and HR staff Jones, uh, Miss Ebony Jones, were uh, employees of the Department of Juvenile Justice with employment authorized uh, with employment authority over me, and they were also uh, agents of that of the state acting on behalf of and in the public interest. <clears throat> in May of 2018, I attended a DJJ's job fair. Uh, the position of, excuse me, ma'am. You, you, you can continue. I just go off camera when I'm drinking, so you can continue. 
Uh, in May 2018, I attended a DJJ's job fair, the, um, the position of a correctional officer slash cadet. I submitted all original documentation to HR for employment in May, original birth certificate, born 1994, of original social security card, original GED certificate, and original military uh, certificate of release from active duty DD form 214 to become employed as a correctional officer slash cadet. I had to successfully meet the DJJ's qualifications and undergo an extensive pre-employment background investigation, pass a drug test, and a medical examination. Your Honor, all my pre-employment background investigation document, uh, documentation identifies my birthday as December 17th, 1994. The special master and GCEO both concur. Throughout DJJ's extensive pre-employment background investigation, Kevin's documents were reviewed and received without objection by the local Metro YDC Human Resources and then Central HR. No one noticed no one noticed any discrepancies in Kevin's birth year, nor were there nor were there any. Uh, I engaged in protected activities in June 2018 by requesting medical accommodations based on my military physical profile. I requested a shaving accommodation uh, due to my shaving uh, condition accommodated for uh, and, and uh, accommodation for resting or sitting capacity related to my complex regional pain syndrome in my left foot, an injury I sustained while in the U.S. Army. Uh, during orientation in, in June, HR informed me that uh, that company policies does not allow men to have beards. I informed HR that I have a chronic medical condition uh, uh, for close shaving. Um, uh, it's a it's a close shaving disorder, and uh, that I do not have medical papers from the military, and, and that I do have medical papers from the military about my skin disorder and foot. I provided HR copies of military profile. Uh, medical profiles. The accommodations was a request to maintain a beard related to my skin disorder. Human Resources rejected my 2018 military dis uh, disability paperwork stating it was not current and HR requested me to provide current supporting medical documentation. The next day, I scheduled an appointment to see my dermatologist. The medical document um, from my dermatologist was also rejected by HR. HR manager Mrs. Lawrence stated that the dermatologist note had unprofessional letterhead and several misspelled words. Ms. Lawrence stated that the doctor's note looked as if I forged it myself and HR requested additional documentation from me. HR belittled and harassed me and required me to resubmit medical documentation three times and accused me of creating a fraudulent doctor's note, which was confirmed to be my uh from which was confirmed to be from my dermatologist later. HR stated that I was uh, approved for my accommodations for my skin disorder, but the very next day I was suspended and escorted off the property and Director Brandenburg signed paper uh, papers to terminate me. During orientation in June, HR informed all new cadets that employee Sergeant Derek Baker was in charge of all cadets. I discussed needing accommodations with Sergeant Baker to sit, rest, or elevate my foot or remove my shoes. I had two conversations with Sergeant Baker about working and standing on my feet for over 12 hours. I asked if my, inj if my injured foot stayed uh, I asked if my injured foot started to hurt during my 12-hour shift of um, walking and standing on the concrete floor. Would it be okay if I sat for a while and rested my injured foot? Uh, I informed Sergeant Baker that I submitted paperwork to HR about my injured foot, known as complex regional pain syndrome, a foot injury sustained while in the military. Uh, Sergeant Baker stated, I will get back to you on that. My second request for accommodation in June with Sergeant Baker about working and standing on my feet for 12 hours. I asked if my injured foot, uh, if my injured foot started to hurt um, during my 12 hour shift, would it be okay if I sat down and, and rested my foot? Sergeant Baker stated to me, I see no purpose for you in the company, in this company or position as a correctional officer. I see no purpose for you continuing to be a member of my team. And I don't see you going to post training, uh, a physical mandatory training camp, uh, for correctional officers. Uh, Sergeant Baker who was questioning my ability to perform due to my left foot injury. Sergeant Baker bragged 
that director Brandenburg had given him the green light to choose which cadet will attend post-training and which cadet will not attend post-training. Sergeant Baker informed me that I will not be going to post-training with, uh, with his team in August. These discriminations and retaliating statements were only made by Sergeant Baker after I requested reasonable accommodations to sit and rest my injured foot. And Sergeant Baker said I I questioned his authority when I asked him to explain DJJ safety policies and procedures to me. The reason uh, the reasonable accommodation that I requested for my foot injury was never addressed. Your Honor, all new cadets were able to attend post-training in August of 2018. I did not attend post-training with Sergeant Baker's team, just as Sergeant Baker stated, because of after 27 days on the job, I was suspended and escorted off the uh, work floor and off the premises by Sergeant Baker in front of my co-workers. A fraudulent birth certificate mysteriously appeared in my HR files after 27 days of being on the job. HR manager, uh, HR manager, Mrs. Uh, Lawrence stated because of the uh, discrepancy with my birth certificate, I was ineligible for post training. Director Brandenburg and Sergeant Baker stated that I was not a good fit to attend post training. And Director Br Br Brandenburg stated that I was crazy. Uh, Director Brandenburg and Sergeant Baker discriminated against me when they stated that I was not a good fit referring to my foot injury. For post-training and Director Brandenburg excluded and blocked me from attending post-training, suspended me and terminated me. Your Honor, Mrs. Jones and Sergeant Baker conspired together and altered my birth certificate uh, to prevent me from attending post-training and to get me fired. On June 27, 2018, I received a phone call um, from employee Derek Baker, uh, Baker uh, had first had hand knowledge. Baker had first hand knowledge of my HR's confidential information concerning issues with my birth certificate and post application. Baker informed me that HR had found an issue with my birth certificate, and I need to report to HR ASAP. Uh, I reported to uh, Human Resources Office on June 27, 2018. Mrs. Jones and Sergeant Baker um, were sitting in Mrs. Jones' office. Employee Derek Baker was the permitted was was then permitted and allowed by HR staff Ebony Jones to stay and listen and attend my HR private and confidential meeting about issues with my post application and birth certificate. Uh, Derek Baker was also present in Mrs. Jones' office on June 27, 2018, when she presented me with a copy of a fraudulent 1993 birth certificate. Mrs. Jones denied inter um, interactions with Sergeant Baker at work during her recorded interview with the GCEO. Mrs. Jones stated that she was only told she only told her supervisor. HR manager Mrs. Lawrence about the issue with my birth certificate. Jones had also told Baker. Uh, Mrs. Jones stated that she had only one interaction with Sergeant Baker at work when Sergeant Baker was first hired in March of 2018. She helped him complete a, his post application. Mrs. Jones stated that he, that he, Sergeant Baker, worked in another building and she and Sergeant Baker never spoke of or discussed Kevin Branson. Mrs. Jones lied and failed to disclose to GCEO's investigators that on June 27, 2018, Derek Baker was presented in her office with, um, when she spoke with him about issues with my birth certificate and post application. HR staff Ebony Jones was a bad actor with dishonest conduct and lack of credibility concerning my falsified documents. First by the CEO. Your Honor, only Ju uh, on July 31st, 2018, I was forced to resign. I was uncomfortable with DJJ's corruption and handling of my personal documents. No pay for over 35 days, hostile work environment. I was humiliated and embarrassed in front of my coworkers. I was retaliated against, uh, falsely accused of submitting a fraudulent documentation to HR for employment, denied reasonable accommodation, disability discrimination based on my military injury. DJJ's failure to investigate the unethical handling of my confidential employment documents. Uh, I was threatened with being arrested on a job, which would have been my, uh, which would have been, excuse me, which would have been a felon on my record. Um, as a uh, as a direct result of DJJ's upper management unlawful, upper management's unlawful conduct, I suffered many sleepless nights, uh, anxiety, and depression. I will be filing a personal injury and gross negligence claim against DJJ. 
Um, Your Honor, on August 1st, 2018, I received a call at home from DJJ Central Office, Employee uh, Relations Department, Mrs. Edwards. Mrs. Edwards apologized to me for the egregious treatment that I suffered at the Metro YDC location. Mrs. Edwards thanked me for my military service. She also noted, uh, noticed, Mrs. Edwards noticed me, uh, noticed me that she instructed pay payroll uh, to expedite my 35 days of back pay. Mrs. Edwards stated that Director Brandenburg did not have permission from employee relations to suspend me and the discrepancy involving my uh, birth certificate was not grounds for suspension or termination. Mrs. Edwards asked me to uh, rescind uh, my resignation and offered to transfer me to another facility. Mrs. Edwards told the GCEO's investigator that employee relations was not clear as to why Director Brandenburg and HR manager Lawrence suspended Kevin. The suspension appeared to result from Kevin's questioning uh, of the DJJ administration and requesting an investigation into human resources about his birth certificate. Your Honor, the entire Metro YDC human resource staff is no longer employed with DJJ. Uh, Dr. I mean, Director Brandenburg, HR manager Lawrence, uh, Sergeant Baker, and uh, HR staff Ebony Jones. Possible illegal illegal activities and corruption. Possible. Uh, I had just been medically discharged from the Army as an honorable dis, uh, disabled veteran. I did not deserve this, uh, the egregious treatment I endured at uh, DJJ. Uh, your Honor, last page. Uh, your Honor, I am requesting a motion of summary judgment that the judge makes the decision without hearing or trial to accept appro um, and approve the GCEO and the uh, special master's final um, opinion and orders based on all uh, material facts, written uh, I'm sorry, written uh, testimonies and recordings that have been uploaded and submitted to the court's uh, records by both the GCEO and the special master. I am requesting a motion uh, for a summary judgment because both the GCEO and the special master have completed an extensive investigation and found reasonable cause to believe that DJJ has incurred an unlawful practice under the Georgia Fair Employment Practices Act of 1978. As the result of its official Failure to consider Kevin's valid reasonable accommodations uh, request made in connection with a with a legally protected disability. Kevin's discharge was the direct result of DJJ's failure to consider said accommodations and retaliations, as well as Kevin's attention attempts to provide additional medical documentation on multiple uh, occasions. Also, Kevin's separation from employment discharge was also an unlawful practice under the act. Your Honor, the special master only ordered five months of back pay for me, according to the GE, according to the EEOC. Back pay is two years prior to the date discrimination uh, complaint was filed. I am requesting two years of full back pay. Your Honor, DJJ can be held liable for uh, negligent acts committed by its employees. I am hoping to file a personal injury claim against DJJ and Superior Court with you, Your Honor, because you are already familiar with the ongoing case. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Uh, here, proceed. Okay, good morning, Your Honor. Um, as you stated at the beginning of this proceeding, um, this is a petition for judicial review case um, where the court sits in an appellate capacity and it isn't any evidence standard of review. My client did file the petition for judicial review. Um, as you can hear from Mr. Branton's um, presentation, the record is, is quite large. It was an um, administrative process below with lots and lots of facts. Um, but I, because this is a uh, administrative decision and it's governed under FIPA, the Fair Employment Practices Act, FIPA also refers to the Administrative Procedures Act for um, the proper procedure here. There is no um, summary judgment process cited in the APA, so it's not the appropriate um, procedure to be applied here. Um, rather, the only question before the court is whether or not my client has met its burden on the petition for judicial review to show that it's rights, um, substantial rights have been violated by the special master's order. Um, so we we do bear the burden of proof on that. Um, the court is required to accept the facts of the special master um, to, if it's if they are supported by any evidence. And as you can see from the brief we filed in this case, um, there are lots of factual findings that are not supported by any evidence. But then the court is um, uh, should review the legal conclusions, uh, essentially de novo for legal error and arbitrary, arbitrary and capricious um, rulings, um, and also if it's not supported by the substantial evidence. 
So uh, I won't go over the facts again in as much detail as Mr. Branton, but he is, yes, he did apply and was hired as a cadet. I'm gonna go over just the highlights here to frame um, the argument for you. Um, he did suffer from, or does suffer from two disabilities, one being a skin condition and one being his left foot. Uh, the special master's order um, addressed three questions and, and one being, did DJJ fail to accommodate him? And in answer to that question, she said, no, DJJ um, met its obligation under VIPA to accommodate him for both of those. And the reasons why she held that is with the skin condition, she said it was ultimately approved. They did um, received the various medical paperwork supporting in the skin condition um, just allows him not to have to have the clean shaven face, which is a policy at DJJ. He was going to be exempt from that. It's called a shaving exemption. Uh, and the reason the judge or the special master found that um, DJJ did properly accommodate because they ultimately agreed to it. Um, the first doctor's note he turned in had very suspicious typos, including a typo in the condition he was saying he had. So they rightfully so um, were not um, comfortable with that. And so they did have to ask for more documentation. But by the time they received it, they approved it. Um, with the left foot condition, he mentions Sergeant Baker. Um, he was not his supervisor. He was um, another co cadet. Um, and that's the only person the special master found that Mr. Branton reported his need for an accommodation with his left foot. And so the special master found that um, he did not properly place his employer on notice of a need for an accommodation with that. Notably, she never found that the director Director Brandenburg ever knew about his left foot condition. So, but the other two questions she addressed were whether or not DJJ discriminated or retaliated against um, Mr. Branton for his disability and his request for disability. And the special master did find against DJJ with respect to that. Um, but we claim that there were um, legal errors on- Pardon? You said that what? Ultimately, she said that they did not accommodate him. Oh, no. So the, with the accommodations, they said, yes, um, they did accommodate him for the disabilities they knew of. But with respect to whether they discriminated against him with in terms of adverse actions taken, the special master said, yes, DJJ did do that. Um, and then also with respect to whether retaliation, whether DJJ retaliated against him for requesting the shaving exemption, the special master entered an order against DJJ for that claim as well. So those are the two um, parts of the order that we have filed a petition for review on, um, because we believe that there is legal error throughout the order. Um, that should support a reversal of the decision by this court or a remand for further proceedings. Um, and the main two, I mean, I have a lot of grounds or we do in the um, brief we filed in the petition, but there's really two main points that I'd like to draw the court's attention to that would support um, a reversal here. And one being the special master found that he um, was, uh, constructively terminated here. Um, and it's a, it, again, it's a very convoluted fact pattern, but what essentially happened was that he, um, there's a birth certificate, I guess, that came into question that looked like it had been forged. There, it's undoubtedly that something was forged because there are two birth certificates in the record, one from showing a date of 94 and one showing a date of 93. Um, it's DJJ's was their pers um, position that he submitted the both of them. And so that called into question his credibility on why a, a falsified birth certificate would have been submitted. The reason they were submitted, one with new hire paperwork, but the second with the paperwork that has to be sent for him to attend post, which he mentioned earlier, the po um, peace officers tra uh, standards training that all the officers have to go through. Um, so when they determined, when they, I guess, became aware of what they deemed to be a fraudulent birth certificate, the director did suspend him with pay um, and sent him home. 
Um, and they did send a request to investigate, or she actually sent a request to terminate that next day, the director did, but she could only request it to the central office. Um, HR also did note on that form, the employee, Mr. Branton, is alleging that someone else falsified his birth certificate. So they did communicate his complaint to central HR as well. Due to some administrative errors, he was not paid during that 30-day suspension initially. Um, and then, but when they discovered the errors, they did pay him um, for the time that he was out. But then he did choose to resign, and that's undisputed. But they they before he resigned, they did ask him to come back when they realized all these administrative errors he hadn't they had made and he chose not to come back. They did call him back also and say, you can come back and work for a different facility. You know, basically let us do the right by you. Um, that circumstance is what the special master found to be a constructive discharge. And our point of error is that under the constructive discharge um, case law, and, and of course FIPA is modeled after the federal anti-discrimination laws, that's not going to be enough to um, overcome the resignation that he submitted and, and to make it a constructive discharge because to be a constructive discharge is an objective standard and it would have to be he'd have to show that no reasonable person in his shoes would have felt to com to um, compelled to resign. Um, meaning that he, or rather he, he uh, would need to show that everybody would have felt compelled to resign in that circumstances and that it was so hostile and terrible that no reasonable person would have stayed. But here the facts are shown that the employer just made administrative errors. They apologized. They asked him, asked him to come back, even offered to transfer him to a different facility. And under an objective standard, that's just not circumstances that someone would feel were so egregious that they are compelled to resign. So if he didn't suffer, if he didn't in fact resign and it wasn't a constructive discharge, he doesn't have an adverse action that FIPA can um, remediate because FIPA really only, the language of FIPA only, um, it, it only speaks to tangible employment actions being taken and they only can remedy those. You can't get compensatory damages. You can only get your back wages and benefits. And um, the other things that the special master pointed out in her order that happened um, were, you know, she claimed were adverse actions. They're just not. Um, the request to terminate, nothing had happened to him. It was just a request. The suspension with pay, nothing happened to him. He did eventually get his money. Um, I think she also pointed to their failure to let him go through post, um, but they couldn't do that when they had the fraudulent document at hand until that was resolved. Um, also, there's no evidence that he wouldn't have been able just to go through post because they were asking him to come back and they do post three or four times a year. Um, but so really the only adverse action he could have suffered that he could be um, could be remediated by FIBA is if he had been terminated and he was not terminated here, he resigned. Um, the other point of error I wanted to highlight is that the judge or the special master incorrectly stated that there's direct evidence of discrimination in this case. And um, that's just simply not the case. Um, the direct evidence is evidence which if you know doesn't require any inference or leap to prove the retaliation or discrimination. Um, and it only includes the most blatant remarks. Um, of discriminatory or retaliatory intent. And, and she doesn't point to anything that would meet that standard. Instead, she just points to statements that Ms. D Director Brandenburg made like about her concern about the fraudulent documents. I and mean, she had before her historical evidence that he had presented a medical document that looked like he had drafted himself. Even though that had been resolved, she, I think, had still thought of that as, as questionable. And then having the whole forge birth certificate, those two um, incidents gave her pause. And so she expressed that that's the reason she requested the 
placed him on suspension and ultimately requested his his termination. But none of those statements are what would typically be considered direct evidence. It's not like she said you can't you would you would need several inferences to draw from those statements to mean to show that she had a retaliatory intent in her mind. Because again, the only um disability accommodation request she knew of was the shaving exemption. And there's undisputed facts in the record that those were routinely granted once you got the proper medical paperwork. And there's nothing in the record showing that she references those accommodation requests specifically and says, that's why I'm doing this. It, and uh, but on the contrary, it has to do more with this forged birth certificate. What about so, the comment that Mr. Branton, I think he said she said to him, which was that you are a little kooky. I don't know if she, I, I think that she did describe him as being a little bit off. And I think that that was just her concern about all these. I think it was a statement. She said that he was a little bit off. Um, but that's not direct evidence of discrimination. You have to be able to tie that directly to an that you are discriminating against him because he were requested an accommodation for his disability. Calling someone a little bit off is, is certainly not, could, you can't draw that direct line there. It's just maybe a piece of circumstantial evidence if one were to view it that way, but I could also see it as just an offhanded comment. Okay. Um, so we, you know, we ultimately, you know, we believe that the judge committed a reversible error because there just was not any type of adverse action that meets the standard under FIPA that he suffered here. And he chose to take himself out of the employment. He resigned. He did not. You know, and, and even the constructive discharge case law does say that it's not a constructive discharge if the employer reaches back out and tries to remediate the situation. And they did, and they recognized their mistakes and they did try to bring him back. They even offered him to go to a different facility and he chose not to. And that is one of the reasons that the judge um, noted or the special master noted in her order why she did not award two years of back pay because he so clearly was given an opportunity to mitigate and come back and he did not choose to do so. I and mean, whether he just, you know, she basically used the words that he was, it was within reason for him to choose not to come back, but that is not the standard of, um, of a constructive discharge, which is you're just compelled to resign. The circumstances are so painful because in the employment law realm, a constructive discharge um, standard, it's, a, it's higher bar to meet than even a hostile work environment. It has to be such an egregious environment that you just can't stay one more minute. And that's just not the facts that we have here. It just has perhaps errors on behalf of the employer that they recognized and tried to try to fix. Um, the one of the things he indicated, well, there are two. <clears throat> one was that, um, well, my first question, Brandenburg, if you transfer it to someone else, is she still the director? Which, how does the department work? Is she still, if he went somewhere else, would she still be ultimately over him? No, Director Brandenburg was over the Metro RYDC, and that's just one of the facilities within DJJ. So when Central Office offered him to transfer, it would be to a different facility with a different director. Okay. Um, and then the second thing, um, 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 lost my train of thought. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, but we've included, I've, in my brief, I include more information about various factual findings that I don't believe are supported by the record, including the record sites and then the proposed order as well. But I wanted to highlight just those two most important arguments and grounds for reversal, really just that there is no adverse action here upon which to base a FIPA claim. And then that the, the fact that there is no direct evidence, um, which is what brings us to the fact that we need to be analyzing things under, you know, a burden shifting. Was there an adverse action? Was there not? Was there reasons? Oh, I'm sorry. Potential? I now I apologize. That's okay. The Brent Branton indicates that the entire staff was terminated. Is that correct? Um, not as a result of this. I think there are various people who in that group who have left for other reasons or been been set gone for other reasons. But it wasn't my understanding from the record that that everybody in that group was let go because of this incident. 
they're just, I mean, unfortunately, DJJ is a, is a, is an agency that has a lot of turnover. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, Your Honor. Yes, give me one moment. Sure. Uh, excuse me, Your Honor. Yes, one moment, please, Mr. Branton. The court will return. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, maybe you'll you all will be able to help me get to where I was trying to go with regard to the um birth certificate. You said that there were two birth certificates allegedly submitted. Um, is it still DJ's James position that Mr. Branton submitted them? Or is it an acknowledgement that something else happened? No, it's uh, DJJ's, it was DJJ's position that he had submitted both of them. The investigation did not conclude because he resigned. So um, it was never completely resolved. Okay. And the birth certificates that were submitted, um, were they physical copies that were submitted? Uh, I believe that the copy he submitted at the job fair in May would have been a physical copy. And um, with regard to the post documentation, he transmits it to their post coordinator who uploads them. Um, so I'm, I have to defer to Mr. Branton if whether or not those are always paper copies or electronic. Uh, they were all original copies. So you submitted them. You submitted it twice, Mr. Clinton. Uh, not to my not. I, I do remember just turning it in for the job fair, and after that, I don't remember having to, to resubmit it again. Oh, uh, okay. So, how do you know they were both original copies? Well, the the copy I only turned in one. I'm saying like, what I turned in was only original copies. I was answering her question. Um, uh, Miss Jones. Jones is the one who told me later uh, um, uh, something about a fraudulent birth certificate, and then that's when she told me to oh well, this one says right here that it's 1993, and you can kind of see where it was edited, like someone used whiteout or something, but uh, I. For uh, uh, clarification, I went and, and brought my original that I, I turned in. I showed her this is what I had. And I guess that's when she might have uploaded, tried to upload that one. And now there's two. You mean the like, forgery is not even a good forgery? It wasn't. And no, you can clearly see that this was forged. You can, it's very bluntly, it was, the three is kind of crooked. Mm -hmm. It's not the same font. Like, you can see it clearly. Uh, the special master, uh, she she had a chance to review that as well. Did she make any comments? Is there someone behind you talking? No, no, ma'am. Is there someone in the room with you give, talking? No, 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 ma'am, no, ma'am. Okay, so with regard to the um, to the font. You were saying that the font was very, you could tell that it was a forgery. Yes, it was very obvious. It was very obvious. The The front wasn't the same, nothing. Um, uh, um, but uh, you could say, you could see where they, they tried to, you could just see on the three, it, it just wasn't the same. It, it was very obvious. If you could see it right now, you'd be like, okay, I see what you're talking about. Okay. And when did when did that come to your attention again? When did what say it again? When did it come to your attention? Oh, uh, when once they called me. They called me, uh Sergeant Baker called me personally and he told me, Hey, uh, we have an issue in HR because Sergeant Baker was my supervisor, even though they say he wasn't. He was my supervisor. He was the one who called me and told me to come up to HR. Uh, there was an issue with my birth certificate. I came up to HR, and then he was in the office and with Mrs. Jones, and Mrs. Jones was the one talking and, and showing me uh, uh, this fraudulent birth certificate. 
Um, and she was saying that, oh, well, it says here in all your paperwork, you're putting 1994, but she said right here it says 1993. And she showed me the, the birth certificate, and I said, no, this isn't what I turned in. I, I was born in 1994, you know. And that's when she requested me to, well, could you show me the, what you turned in? And I guess that's how two got in. Uh, she, so she probably took the one that I originally uh, submitted. She probably forged it and then uh, had me come in with my, the original again. So now it looks like it, I submitted two when originally I just submitted in the one that I originally submitted in uh, during job my uh, the job fair. So was that before or after the whole argument about your foot and the cadet uh, in post training? Oh, that was after that was after the foot uh, in incident. That was after the foot incident. So was that after Miss? Was that after Sergeant Baker told you you wouldn't go to post? Correct. That was exactly after that. Probably like one week, if not shorter than that. It was like one week later. This happened. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll review everything and I'll take it on it. I said, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. We excuse. <laughs>